So she did all of the different jhana and samadhi practices, and then the teacher that she was with had several very fine students. Out of some thousands of students, she and two other women were really good yogis. So he said, all right, let's play. Let's do all the psychic powers as well. So she learned, I don't know that this is true, but her teacher, her teacher told it to me anyway. She learned time travel, and he said they got so good, these three women that he was training, that they would sit in there, they had a little meditation hall for the women and do their practice, and then when it was time for interview, they would simply dematerialize their body and appear in his room for interview and have a little discussion about their practice and then disappear and go back. This is what he said. I mean, you can take it for whatever it's worth. Hey there, and welcome back to Heart Wisdom, Jack Hornfield's podcast on the Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh, and I am honored to invite you in to episode 230, The Inspiration of Deepa Ma. March 25th marks what would be Deepa Ma's 113th birthday if she was still in body. In this episode, which was first recorded as a Dharma talk at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in November of 1989, shortly after Deepa Ma's dropping of her body. Jack shares miracle stories and personal stories of his time with Deepa Ma. And in it, she starts to live in your heart a little bit, at least she did in mine. Her sweetness, her loving kindness, her grandmotherliness. When Jack gets going in this episode telling stories, you can really feel her essence through him. He lights up and you really feel that warmth and that sense of awe and possibility in the great mystery. And that is why this is truly one of my favorite episodes. So before we introduce you to the inspiration of Deepa Ma, I do have a few Jack events that are coming up that may pique your interest. On March 25th, Jack does his Spirit Rock Monday Night Dharma Talk for the month of March. This is pay what you can and really a great way to check in with Jack and get a good boost of spiritual community and connection online. Then on March 29th at 9 a.m., Jack is going to be live online with Louis Schwartzberg the director of Fantastic Fungi, for a talk on psychedelics and mindfulness. This is presented by Banyan. And then on April 2nd, Jack will be on a live call with Raghu Marcus and Jacqueline Dabrinska of the Love Serve Remember Foundation called The Gift of Ram Dass. It is all about how we can put Ram Dass's perspectives into our daily practice. As you know, both Jack and Raghu have spent so much time with Ram Dass, and they'll be sharing stories both from the early years and his later years on Maui. And finally, this is the last call to get in on the live version for the Walking the Eightfold Path with Jack Cornfield online course. The course will always be up, but we have two live question and answer sessions with Jack taking place March 28th and April 3rd. And if you sign up before then, you can get in on those offerings that accompany this amazing journey down the Eightfold Path. All of these can be found at jackcornfield.com, either under events or courses. So there you go. I invite you to cozy up and enjoy meeting this wonderful spiritual being, Deepama. May you be happy, may you be healthy, May you help others through the authenticity of your being, and may your heart be smiling. Namaste. I'd like to talk about a person that's very dear to me, but before I do, I want to read what I remember of of the teachings in one of the earliest books of uh, Carlos Castaneda, The Teachings of Don Juan. Where he says, Don Juan says, when I was younger, my benefactor asked me a question, but I was too hot-blooded to understand it. Now I'm older, and I ask it of you. You must look at your life, 
and your way. And there's no shame in dropping whatever you have undertaken as long as it's not done out of fear or ambition. But there is one question and one question alone that matters. Does this path have heart? All paths lead out of the bush and back into the bush, he says. All paths go from nothing to something to nothing again, as our lives do. So there is only one question for us. I'd like to tell a story tonight about an old woman in Calcutta who was a friend of mine and a teacher who just died this week because I loved her very much and she loved me and because she chose a path with heart and lived it well. Her name was Deepama Barua, and she lived with her daughter and her grandson, who she named, she and her daughter named him together, named Rishi, which is the name for an Indian sage, in a very simple apartment in a small street, kind of run-down street in Calcutta. Of course, every street in Calcutta is run-down. She was quite poor, and her apartment was right below the stairs where you went up was a metal grinding shop, and she cooked like most people did in Calcutta on a little charcoal stove on the floor in the kitchen, and that's how you cook in India for the most part. And she was also a teacher of many students, mostly of older women in the Calcutta Buddhist community who would come over and bow to her and pay their respects and then sit down and have tea and talk about who knows what in Bengali, probably talk about cooking and knitting and um, Dharma practice and enlightenment and sort of the same conversation. This was my fantasy. And that place where she lived in Calcutta, which I visited many times, I made a film that's that I haven't finished editing of her and of that place in part. Um, and at one point in the filming, I just stood on the corner of the street near her house and left the camera on for a while. And man pulled rickshaws, barefooted rickshaw pullers came by, and old horse carts, they were stagecoaches right out of Western movies, came by with people leaning out of every window, piled high with various mercantile goods. And people walked by carrying bathtubs on their heads and... <laughs> Children were out bathing in the puddles in the streets that, that were overflowing from broken pipes. And the whole of India, which is just the nature of life in India, was there out in the street. I'd heard of her through the colleagues and friends I teach with, through Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg. And I heard that she was an extraordinary yogi and a wonderful teacher. One of the first stories I heard was from a man who practiced in India in the late 60s and early 70s for some years. He was a very uh, um, avid meditator, and he shaved his head, and he wore white, and he spent lots of years in temples and ashrams and monasteries, and his parents hated it. He was probably in his early 30s at that time, and he should have been in medical school or law school or one of those places that one's parents often think we should be. And his mother particularly was very unhappy. It was as if he had died, as if she had lost a son. And every time that he went to see Deepama, she would ask about his mother. How is your mother? How is she doing? When you do your sittings, are you doing metta for your mother? Every time you sit, you should put your mother in your heart and send her loving kindness. And then one time she went in her back room and she went under the mattress, which is, that's how it's done, and pulled out a roll of Indian banknotes and pulled out the biggest Indian banknote there is, which is a hundred rupees that's worth... Uh, I don't know, about $12 or something like that. But it was a lot of money for her from under the mattress and went back in and put it in his hand, closed his hand and said, go buy a present and send it to your mother. And that was the way that she taught. 
It was interesting because six years after that time, this man's father had a stroke and was badly paralyzed. Uh, and this man left his ashram and practiced in India and let go of his white robes and whatever he was wearing and went home and lived in Florida in a retirement community in not such an easy circumstance and spent three years taking care of his father all the time until his father died. So he was training himself to do something. Her teaching was to always keep people in your heart, to give of your love to the people and the earth and the world around. She was born in the greater British Empire in the early part of the century, when India and Pakistan and Burma were all just greater British India. And she was married young, probably around age 14, which was, I guess, the normal age to get married in India, you know, they just said, well, you'll marry him. And that was how it was. I'm not sure that that's actually much worse than the way we do it, as a matter of fact. Um, but in any case, that's how it was. And her husband was a civil servant, and they eventually had three children. After some time, her husband got ill and then died. And then one of her children died. And following that, another child became ill and also died. So she lost her husband and two children in a short period of time, one after one another. And at age 40, she was left caring for her remaining daughter. And as you can imagine, also left with an enormous amount of loss and grief and sorrow. And in a way, in that time, she faced what we all have to face as human beings, which is not just the beauty and majesty of life, but also the inevitable loss and suffering of life. And she saw in the deepest way that we can see it with the people we most love, the inevitability of sorrow and suffering as a part of human life. And she wanted to find freedom. She said she came to, after this, as you can imagine, a very deep desire to practice meditation. So she went to the most famous meditation center of her day, to Mahasi Saido's monastery in Rangoon. And she threw herself into the practice. She was so deeply motivated, as you can imagine. She also was a natural at meditation. She had a very powerful natural samadhi, a very powerful capacity to be present and concentrated. In fact, she said she was doing walking meditation very slowly, and after the third or fourth day, she was walking along and just feeling the sensations of her body, which had already dissolved. There wasn't a body at this point after a few days of meditation, but just this play of sensations. And all of a sudden, she noticed that her leg was very heavy, and then it became hot, and there was some painful sensation, and she just couldn't walk any further. And she looked down, and one of the dogs in the monastery had grabbed her leg and bit it very hard, and she wasn't aware of that, so much was she simply paying attention to the sensations in her body. Well, in three or four days later, she went to the deepest stages of insight and awakening that were offered in that monastery. It took her about a week, basically, <laughs> to do her practice. And after she did that, she went through, there's a variety of meditation exercises which are kind of reviewing, where you really look at all the things that make up the nature of body and mind as we know it, and you dissolve that until you can go to any level of being and see the relative level of the reality, and also dissolve it to see its fundamental emptiness. She did all of that, and then she did samadhi practices, the practices of a profound concentration in addition to the insight work she did, um, the jhanas, they're called, and they're ways of practicing with the breath or with loving kindness, with various objects, in which you make the mind so concentrated on the breath or on a light or a visualization or a feeling 
that everything disappears. All the sights and sounds and sensations, gradually they disappear, and the whole body and mind becomes filled with light. Or beyond filled with light, it becomes a sea of peaceful, silent consciousness, infinite, without any movement. And then things start to re-arise again. So she did all of the different jhana and samadhi practices. And then the teacher that she was with had several very fine students. Out of some thousands of students, she and two other women were really good yogis. So he said, all right, let's play. Let's do all the psychic powers as well. So she learned, I don't know that this is true, but her teacher Her teacher told it to me anyway. She learned time travel, and he said they got so good, these three women that he was training, that they would sit in there, they had a little meditation hall for the women and do their practice, and then when it was time for interview, they would simply dematerialize their body and appear in his room for interview and have a little discussion about their practice and then disappear and go back. This is what he said. You can take it for whatever it's worth. But in any case... Um, she was an extraordinary yogi by any standards. There are, for those of you who are interested in these kinds of psychic games, and they're really possible, I assure you, um, there's a long and very detailed Buddhist text called the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification, which has a description of all the practices that you need to do to walk on water or dissolve your body into light or double your body, you know, if you're having trouble getting your work done this week or (laughs) things like that. (laughs) At one point on a beautiful fall day, she came to this country a few times to teach and it was during the three-month retreat in New England in Barrie and it was one of those crystal clear autumn days in New England when the sky is blue with a few puffy clouds and the trees are this uh, display of light and flames and color that's just extraordinary. We took a walk outdoors and we're sitting by a lake near the center on a rock and the lake was reflecting all these colors. And there were a number of people there and one of them kind of motioned her and said, this must be just like the heaven realms, because she'd done all these traveling and all these realms and stuff. And she just looked at him and said, nah, it's nothing like it at all. (laughs) She said, it's okay, you know, but it's not really, it doesn't touch it. The realms of light, the realms of peace, the realms that are possible, not just for her, but really that are part of our consciousness when we understand how to touch them and access them. So she became a truly great yogi. All of the possibilities that one can do with the heart and mind, she was a great master of them. And she said as she practiced, I looked at the truths that the Buddha described in his teaching, and I wanted to see if these were so. For myself, I wanted to understand them. And so I did it, and I discovered that they were true. I discovered that attachment And this sense of separateness of self is false, and it leads to suffering. And I discovered another way to live. Yet to be with her as this master yogi, you would never know it. There was no show. There was no pretense. There was nothing special about her in that way. She was very peaceful as a person, and she very much lived the Dharma by just being herself. A good friend of mine, uh, who is a psychologist and a meditation teacher, was doing his doctorate at Harvard University during this time. He was also a student of hers, and part of what he did was to go to India and give Rorschach tests and TAT, a few of the psychological projective tests, to the greatest yogis that he could find to see if he could figure out what was going on in there. So he found a number of people who were adepts in meditation and gave these tests to them um, and came up with interesting results, which included showing people who'd had some very deep realization and at the same time had some really neurotic stuff still completely intact in their lives, that both of those were true. She was the exception. She was the most advanced yogi that he was able to test and work with. Um, 
And he said that, he described one of the tests, which is a very common psychological test, where these 10 picture cards of of kind of ambiguous scenes of people, uh, men, women, children, and in situations you can't figure out whether they're coming in the door or leaving, where they've just had a fight or they just got married or whatever, and you just see it, and uh, it evokes a story, and you tell a story. So he showed these ten cards to her, and each card that he showed to her, she told a story, and each story that she told was a Dharma story of how these people had been entangled in some way in their lives and how they too had come to freedom or understanding or peace. But not only that, as she told her story and he presented each card, she wove each of those ten cards into one long story. (laughs) He came back to Harvard with his findings and showed them to, and then went to the University of Chicago as well and showed them to the world's experts on Rorschach and TAT and these, these projective tests. And they shook their heads. They had, they had never seen this done before. And then one person said, oh, yes, there was one other time. And apparently someone had gone down to South America to the jungles, to some of the tribes where there was still a very deep shamanic practice that was alive and found the oldest and wisest shaman they could find in the Amazon and given these tests to them too. And the old guy had done the same thing. He told a story that knitted all ten together and in the ten showed the path to awakening, the path with heart. So there was one precedent for this. How did she teach? It was an interesting combination to work with her as a student and also to be with her when she did interviews, speaking with people. First of all, she was very demanding. In that guise, she was a tough old grandma, and she really expected you to to do it. She expected the best from people. She expected tremendous sincerity. She said, I did it. I did it in a week. You know, the least you can do is is do it. Um, And... Not only did she expect it, but somehow she evoked that in you. She evoked the sense that in each person is a tremendous capacity to awaken, to be present, to face ourselves, to be aware, to live freely. And she asked that, that you give your whole body and heart and spirit and mind as fully as you can to your meditation practice, to your spiritual life as a whole, and to the way that you live. In some way, being around her, it was as if, what other way would one want to live? You know, what other way is possible other than to do it fully? And so that was the spirit. And you had a sense from this very sweet, mild-mannered old lady of a kind of unshakable inner strength, an incredible sense of stillness and strength in her being. She deeply believed as I do, in the power of silence, in the power of sitting and opening and listening, in the power of mindfulness, of wakefulness to discover and live wisely in our life. And she would always ask, how is your sitting? Very sincerely, how much are you sitting? What happens when you do it? Um, How is your mindfulness? How awake are you in your life? Basically, the question is, are you really doing it or just kind of thinking about it? It's a great idea to live that way. Are you living your life that way? So this was the first aspect of her interviews, this sense of integrity and of being very demanding, but also of evoking this possibility in us. The second quality of her interview and her teaching was to question people, do you see the truth? It's right here in front of you. Do you see the truth that we possess nothing? That we own nothing? That underneath all of that, that we are nothing? That none of it is ours? And that to possess and make separate and get caught in our greed and fear and all those things that the personality gets caught in is not the truth of our reality. We sit or walk or stand or live 
in this separate shell of a self, as if we were separate. Do you see the truth that you don't own this very body, these feelings, these thoughts? There's this incredible mystery. We, we sit on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Every moment that we are alive, we are in this mystery. We are this mystery. Do you see this? So her, her teaching was to awaken people to see what is true. And then the last quality of her teaching, to mention anyway tonight, was that she was very loving and very grandmotherly. She would, you know, you'd come in, especially if it was in India, how are you feeling? How is your health? That was one of her first questions, which was very relevant for anyone who's not traveled in India, I should say that, or for anyone who has. And it was really kindly, you know, are you eating well? Is it, are you doing okay and with our climate and food and so forth? And whoever came in that she worked with, and she worked with a lot of American students during her time here, in whatever state, doubting, I can't do it, it's too hard, or joy and delight, or fear, or anger, or frustration, or rage, it did not matter what state they came in, she loved them. She would smile when people walked in the room, and there was this outpouring of welcome, welcoming loving kindness didn't matter who came in or what circumstances or what they had to say. That level was irrelevant to her. What was simply important was that here was another person to be loved. And she had this beautiful kind of old lady smile. It was wonderful. My favorite scene in all the footage that I shot of her is of her hanging out the laundry Remember last week that I said that Zen saying that says, after ecstasy, the laundry, right? <laughs> well, there's this long shot, maybe two or three minutes of Deepama just kind of out there hanging out the laundry and smiling and just enjoying hanging out the laundry. And it's wonderful to see her in the sunshine in this yard. It was in, in the U.S. where she was staying at the meditation center. She didn't use the dryer. She put out her laundry line, washed her things by hand like you do in India, and then hung out the laundry and, and was beaming about it. It's kind of, I'd like to take a, just a frame of it. Make, it's like a still life, you know, um, laundry with saint or something <laughs> like that, right? Somehow in her being and her presence was a silent integrity, a silent sense of completion or rest or wholeness. It is as if she lived in harmony with the Tao, which she did. She lived in harmony with life. There is a description in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, somewhere here of Suzuki Roshi by one of his students. And it speaks to my experience of Deepama as well. Roshi, or a master or teacher like Deepama, is a person who has actualized that perfect freedom which is the potential for all of us as human beings. They exist freely in the fullness of their whole being, and their flow of consciousness is not the fixed repetitive patterns of our usual self-centered awareness, but rather arises spontaneously and naturally from the actual circumstances of the present. The results of this in terms of the quality of life are extraordinary. Buoyancy, vigor, straightforwardness, Simplicity, humility, serenity, <clears throat> joyousness, uncanny perspicacity, and unfathomable compassion. Their whole being testifies to what it means to live in the reality of the present moment. Without anything said or done, just the impact of being with such a person can be enough to change one's whole perspective on life. 
But in the end, it's not the extraordinariness of such a teacher which perplexes, intrigues, or deepens the student. It is the teacher's utter ordinariness, their simplicity. She was a very simple person, and there wasn't a sense at all of pretense about her. Her wish that was simply that each person be themselves, that each student, each person that she encountered or taught, be all that they could be, that we be all that we can be, <coughs> that we live with the deepest wisdom, that we open our hearts with infinite compassion, and that there wasn't any sense of how you should do that. She didn't want people to come and live in India forever or be monks or join an ashram. She said, live your life, do the dishes, do the laundry, take your kid to kindergarten, you know, raise your children or your grandchildren if you have them, as she did. Take care of the community in which you live and make all of that your path. Follow your path with heart. I remember once with sitting with Deepama and asking, asking her, what is it like in your consciousness? What's in your mind? And she smiled, which she did very often, closed her eyes for a moment, and she said, in my mind are three things. It's a lot more than what I, I mean, a lot less than what I find when I sit. Anyway, <laughs> she said, concentration, loving kindness, and peace. I said, that's all? She said, yeah, that's all. I said, oh, how wonderful. You know, and then we sit, right? You know, what do you see in there? What a, what a wonderful sense of being. Concentration, which is the kind of steadiness, presentness, loving kindness, and peace. When I first met her, first went to her little apartment in Calcutta, someone took me up there, it was kind of awkward because I'd been a monk for a while and I was used to bowing to all these teachers and, you know, putting them, they were sitting up here in front with big Buddhas and you'd put a little incense in front and get down on the floor. And that was fine, I liked bowing. And I, so I started to bow to her and it was a little bit awkward, I really didn't know. I mean, she wasn't a monk, she was a householder. And... Um, and instead, she just kind of picked me up off the floor and came up and gave me this great big bear hug. You know, and she's really, she was very short. She was like four foot nine or something like that. So I'm not so tall, but I was about a foot taller than her. And she just came over and gave me this great big hug, which is how she greeted me every time I saw her. And it was wonderful. None of this bowing stuff. I'm not the big teacher that we have to make a big deal about. Just a huge hug. And that was wonderful. And then she looked at me and I was introduced and she said, oh, they tell me that you're a meditation teacher. I said, uh-oh, you know, there was really in trouble. So we talked for a while about teaching and about my own practice. She asked a lot of questions about how I live my life and what my inner life was like, how I work with things. And finally, in the end of that conversation, she gave me a blessing. And that's the thing that she did most of anything in working with people. And I think in her life, she just went around giving blessings. And she gave wonderful blessings. She would chant and give blessings. And she would sing and give blessings and different kinds. May you be blessed. And may you be blessed. And may you be blessed. It was wonderful. And uh, they were special blessings. She She actually had a kind of extra special blessing, which I've talked about some other evenings in previous talks some, some months ago. But I remember one time going to see her, and I had just been studying and training in India for some period of time. Um, and I'd been going through a lot of difficulty in my life at that period. I forget what the difficulty was, but it was something like, you know, money or women or ego or this, you know, something. What, you know, that's the normal stuff. Anyway, I was going through some difficulty or identity crisis. Or whatever. And uh, I went back and I practiced and I stayed in this wonderful ashram and I spent time with the teacher and so forth. I went to Calcutta 
And I was coming back to begin to teach the next three-month retreat in Barrie. And she knew I was about to do that. And so I paid my respects to her, and we spent a little bit of time talking. And then I was going to go, and she gave me her usual big bear hug to go. And then she said a blessing. So I kind of got down on my knees, which made me about equal to her in height. And the, the way she did her extra special blessing is she would take her hands and she would just stroke your head and your whole body. She would just kind of gently stroke you like this and blow on you at the same time like this and then say Buddhist prayers at the same time she would do that. And she did that for, I was a, it seemed like forever. It was probably five minutes, a very, very long blessing. And at first I did, she was doing it and it felt nice and then she kept doing it and it felt better and better and then I started to smile and, and by the time she was done I was just grinning. I just, everything was lit up and open. It was extraordinary. And she said, go and teach a good retreat for all of those people and, you know, go with my blessings, whatever. It's sort of grandmother sending you off with her blessings. May you be blessed. So I left her place and this was in the summer in Calcutta. Let me tell you the traffic in the summer in Calcutta. So I got, I was going from her place to the airport. Dum Dum Airport is its name. This is true. <laughs> and I got in a taxi. It took about two hours in an Indian taxi with the guy leaning on the horn the whole way and dodging between rickshaws and tra traffic jams and, and fumes and, and pollution and whatever and, and incredible heat and humidity and poverty. And finally I got to the airport and got through Indian Customs, which was another hour of standing in line, people stamping your things and looking and grilling you and whatever. Then got on my airplane and took the plane flight, which is a couple of hours uh, from uh, Calcutta to Bangkok, and got into Bangkok, which is like Los Angeles, this great big airport, and again in long lines and customs. The entire way, <clears throat> got through customs, in Bangkok and got in a taxi and drove an hour and a half through Bangkok traffic to my hotel. I did not stop grinning the entire way. I was just sitting on the plane, going through customs, standing in line, all this traffic jam, and I'm just sitting there going like this. It was extraordinary. It just wouldn't wear off. It was wonderful. May you be blessed. Anyway, I'm sure wherever she is now is infinitely better than Calcutta and that she's fine. And as she leaves in her death, in her departing, as in the death of every person, there is a legacy. Each of us leave whatever we lived as ripples that touch every other being, as ripples that connect with all of life. And she left me and she left us on this earth with a wonderful legacy, a wonderful gift. The gift, first of all, of her blessings, that wherever she went, she gave the blessings of her loving kindness. And the gift of simplicity, of not being pretentious, of not making anything special, but of living in the reality of the present, of, of a person, of a being who followed her path with heart. And the point, perhaps, in speaking of her tonight, is not that one is supposed to be like Deepama Barua or some other great yogi or saint you might read about or hear about or be like the Buddha or Jesus or Mother Teresa, but something much more difficult, which is to be yourself, to be ourselves, to sit and to discover that all that we seek is to be found here, and now in our own hearts, in our own beings, that the capacity of infinite compassion and wakefulness and freedom is here in ourselves. I read a poem for her from the Zen monk Ryokan, who also lived simply. Today, while begging food, a sudden downpour of rain, I waited out the storm in a small shrine, laughing, one jug for water, one bowl for rice. My life is like an old run-down hermitage, poor, simple, quiet. 
In the entire ten directions of the Buddha worlds, there is only one way. When we see clearly, there is no difference in all the teachings. What is there to lose? What is there to gain? If we gain something, it was there from the beginning. If we lose anything, it is hidden nearby. Pretending again, I do not know where I am going. A fresh wind blows and the bright moon covers the autumn sky. Very simple. What is there to lose? What is there to gain? None of that matters. If we gain something, it was here from the beginning. If we lose anything, it is hidden nearby. She leaves me and I will ask the same of you some questions to look at our life. Maybe sit for a moment, let your eyes close. Some of her questions, I'll just pass them along from my grandmother. Do we have ideas of practice in spiritual life, or do we really do it? Do we sit? Do we awaken? Do we live it? Have we let ourselves look deeply into what is true? What is usually in our minds? How much love? How much peace? How much wakefulness and awareness? Have we chosen to live our path with heart? If not, what is it time for in our life? Could you live your life so that everything you do is blessed, every joy and every sorrow, every person you touch, every day that you greet, is embraced like a big hug, that you bring a blessing, that you sit and be blessed, and walk and be blessed. That you live with your family and be blessed. That you live in the whole world and touch it with your blessings. Bhutang Sarananga Chami, Dhammang Sarananga Chami, Sankhang Sarananga Chami. I take refuge in the Buddha, in the Buddha within, in this capacity to awaken infinite compassion and freedom of heart. I take refuge in the Dharma, in the truth in that which is just here to be seen and awakened and discovered. 
I take refuge in the Sangha, in the community of all of those awakening together and in our interconnectedness to bring the heart and the spirit of a Buddha to the whole of the earth. I feel really blessed, many, many ways. Blessed to have a grandmother like that, wonderful. Blessed to be here together. Blessed to be touched in some way by the Dharma. We could take a few minutes for your thoughts or questions, comments, but let me ask this evening if you do, and then we'll do a few announcements at the end. Let's speak about the path with heart. If you want to say anything, I would be particularly interested in your sense of that, your resonance with your, with your own life your struggles with that. Please. The psychic powers? Ah. Watch out. The, the title is the Visuddhi Magga, the Path of Purification. You can probably get a copy of it at Mandala Bookstore. If not, they could order it for you. And it's under the whole center section, which is called the, the Powers of Concentration. There's a chapter on the cities or Idibata of all of the psychic powers and how to do them. Good luck. Good <laughs> luck.